morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the second of eight presentations of our webinar for ESL and EFL teachers at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso. Digital learning and teaching, promoting autonomous student learning. First of all, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Sebastián Adaros, and I am a teacher in the English program at PUCB. I will be leading this presentation today. This presentation lasts approximately 30 minutes during which you will be able to write your questions to our speaker using the Zoom chat. Questions will be answered during the 10 minutes allotted at the end of the presentation. Please, when writing your questions, make sure that the chat is set so that your questions are sent to everyone so that me as a, so that I as a moderator can also read them and pass them to the speaker when it's time for that. Now I would like you to introduce, sorry, now I would like to introduce to you Dr. Marlon Valencia. He is assistant professor and director of the ESL program, the Open Learning Center and the certificate in the discipline of teaching English as an international language in the Department of English at Glendon College, York University in Toronto, Canada. He teaches ESL and applied linguistics. His research interests include multiliteracies, language politics, the use of technology in the language classroom, as well as the intersection between creativity, imagination, and teachers and language learners' identities. Dr. Valencia is a licenciado in Lenguas Modernas from Universidad del Valle in Colombia. He holds an MA in Foreign Languages and Cultures from Washington State University, an MA in Applied Linguistics from York University, and has completed his PhD in language and literacies education, as well as a collaborative program in comparative international and development education at the University of Toronto. Without further ado, I leave, with you, I leave you with our speaker, Dr. Marlon Valencia, and his talk titled, What Have We Learned After One Year of Remote Teaching and Learning? sharing ideas to maximize the use of technology in the ESL and EFL classroom. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, let me just fix my camera. I'm really happy to be here uh, today. Uh, so thank you very much for this wonderful invitation. So the idea is that we share uh, some ideas and some of the experiences that uh, we've all gathered or I guess suffered. <laughs> after one year of remote teaching and learning. So let me just share my screen. Okay, good. So this is the outline of uh, this uh, presentation. So it has two parts. In the first part, I will talk about uh, facilitating learners voluntary engagement while teaching remotely. Um, so I will talk about me and my context and how, um, what kind of class uh, format I used uh, this year, how to build a welcome and collaborative online learning community. Um, I will share some of the ideas uh, or experiences that I got uh, creating a YouTube style mini lessons. Um, also uh, some ideas on rethinking assignments and assessment uh, for remote delivery. And in the second part of the presentation, I will talk about managing a healthy and sustainable workflow. So uh, I will start by unpacking the uh, neoliberal narrative of teacher uh, success. Um, and uh, I will also give some recommendations based on research. And then I will provide my own uh, insights, uh, which will also lead to an invitation for you to share your thoughts. So first, how to facilitate learners' voluntary engagement while teaching remotely. Hmm. That was a big challenge for um, all of us, I guess. And uh, 
it not only comes from my experience as a teacher, but also as a, I would say as an uncle, like I asked my um, college age um, nephew about uh, his experience at university. And he said, oh, everything is going quite well. I just uh, like my professors uh, pre-record their lessons and I watch it at twice the speed. So it goes very fast. And I was like, hmm, I don't really want my students to be doing that. So, okay. Um, you already know a little bit about myself, but I'll tell you a few things that you might not know. Um, well, you know that I'm, uh, I'm a professor at Glendon College uh, and you know my research interests, but I am also a husband and a father of two children. I love photography and I've taught um, courses like language and identity at Ryerson University. And uh, we teach content English for academic purposes for um, undergraduate students at Glendon. And that's the same uh, kind of approach to uh, EAP that I taught before at Sheridan College. So this is my family and you will see lots of pictures in uh, this presentation. Uh, and we have a chocolate lab, that's a recent addition. And I'll tell you why all that matters. So photography, uh, this is my uh, growing year. So I began with just uh, the SLR that, I, that you see on the left side and then it started growing. Now I'm going into uh, mirrorless uh, and you can see some of my pictures uh, on my Instagram, Dr. Marlon Valencia. And uh, here are some pictures. So that's Joshua and uh, Percy. We also play sometimes with pictures, doing long exposures and things like that. So you see, uh, I'm really invested in photography. I like doing astrophotography as well. And that all matters because this is part of who I am. And uh, just to give you an example, right now I'm home with my two kids somewhere. So I hope you don't hear them <laughs> at any point, but that might happen. Um, and uh, this is what students get when you go to the classroom. They get you as a whole. You cannot leave your person side uh, like um, by the door and then just have the teacher um, identity, right, uh, in the classroom. So this is the context. So Glendon College is uh, York University's bilingual campus and uh, bilingualism in Canada focuses mostly on English and French. And I say mostly because there are indigenous languages and a lot of other languages used uh, every day in Canada. So uh, York is the third largest university in Canada. Um, I teach content ESL to Franco dominant students. And I also teach future teachers of English. So some of the examples uh, that I will show or share in this presentation come from uh, that uh, program. So I will um, talk about my experience by uh, using the ADI model. So this is a model uh, that uh, was uh, created to um, create, produce, um, and deliver uh, online lessons. And uh, it applies uh, very well to video. So how did I use this to um, create YouTube style mini lessons? So in the first part, and this is the acronym, ADI. So it begins uh, with analyzing. So you identify your entire lessons overarching goal and decide on your mini lesson specific goals. Then you envision a time frame for the mini lesson, always keeping in mind your learner's needs and how this video lesson fits in what you want to achieve long term. So you have to, you know that as a teacher, you always have the big picture in mind, but then you plan for uh, the immediate goals, right? So one uh, thing that we teachers do quite often is that we do backwards planning, right? So we think about the ultimate goal that uh, students need to achieve uh, to be successful in our course. And then we start planning backwards. Okay, what do I need to measure that goal? What kind of test or assignment, right? And then I go backwards. How do I make sure that they will do well in that test? What do I need to teach? 
and then you start going backwards until you get to the very beginning. This is kind of like what you do in this first part of analyzing. And I will share some of the pictures and things um, and maybe some uh, very brief clips uh, from uh, mini lessons so that you can have a sense of what I've done. Um, so um, two observations about uh, teaching language and literacies. So we were so focused on teaching uh, students how to write essays, uh, academic essays, for example, at the university. Uh, but uh, our students were engaging in um, uh, daily use of uh, and consumption of digital literacies. And it seemed like we were in two different worlds, right? Well, that um, dichotomy became even uh, more salient with remote teaching because then uh, it was all packaged pretty much on the same screen, right? So um, Darwin says that by systematically expanding the scope and spaces of digital literacy uh, instruction in educational curricula, the hope is that youth of different social class positions will have equitable opportunities to invest in digital literacies that assert their legitimate place in the new social order. So think about the new social order, right? It's not just for students, but also for teachers. Like think about the future teachers, how much um, of this uh, digital uh, literacy would they need to actually teach in the future when things are still so uncertain, right? Okay, so after analyzing, you move on to the design stage. So you plan a strategy for developing your video lesson. You outline your established goals and determine what tools you can use to deliver that lesson. Uh, like the camera that you're going to use, the tripod, green screen, um, lighting, video editing software, props, all that. And then you see how uh, you can uh, make it happen. So I'm gonna show you uh, some uh, pictures and you already know that I've, I'm really invested in photography. So I've been playing with green screens before the pandemic. Uh, they do have uh, offer a lot of wonderful possibilities, but uh, the thing that you have to keep in mind is that you don't have to have fancy toys like me. Uh, there's great possibilities and I will discuss them, right? So this is uh, Joshua, my son. We were creating a, a short story for my um, daughter's um, um, French class. And uh, you see the magic of the green screen. Um, so you take the picture on the green screen and then you change the background for whatever you want it to be, right? Here's another example. The uh, unicorn is quite small, but then you see I can make it giant. And uh, then uh, we use a background that uh, the, my children also created uh, to uh, resemble Mars. And then Sophie looks very small and fitting a carrot to the giant uh, unicorn. So um, you can make a uh, green screen, um, like uh, you can have your own green screen uh, very cheaply. Uh, like uh, on the left side, you can see uh, a green screen made out of a, just a folder that is green, right? It depends on what uh, kind of video or picture you're taking, right? You can use just cardboard or maybe you can even use a pizza um, box and just paint it green, right? Um, I'll show you a, a short part of a clip uh, of a lesson that I created using green screen. Welcome to the Halloween edition of ENSL 2700. I am Marlon Valencia, Professor Emeritus. Today, we are reviewing the ancient scriptures of uh, witchcraft that we call APA style. So, I'm going to ask you to Okay, so you see the possibilities. I've been playing with this a lot, so don't get scared and think like, oh, how am I going to be able to do that? What we have to keep in mind is that this requires um, a lot of exploration and stretching, 
and then a lot of failure as well. And from that you learn. So uh, some of the recommended production software uh, that uh, I've seen on the literature uh, for Mac, uh, there are many, many apps for sure. Uh, and MacBooks come with iMovie or if you have a, an iPhone, then you can use it there. Uh, there are different um, apps that you could use for free and some you have to buy uh, to uh, produce and edit uh, videos. Uh, and uh, on the PC side, uh, I've read about WeVideo. Uh, you can use it for free. There's an educational license. Uh, it requires a lot of investment, uh, like playing with the tools and uh, seeing the possibilities. Camtasia is also good. It's a, a fairly straightforward video uh, editing um, software. And they also have the Mac version. So this is um, a book that I think is a good resource. And some of the pictures come from this book. Uh, it, it's called the Green uh, Screen um, Makerspace. It was created by a teacher. And you see some ideas on how to create green screens for under $5. Of course, there's all kinds of uh, fancy stuff that you can find out there. And if you will see like recommendations about the lights that you have, have to use, you don't need to use studio lights. Okay, I'll show you what I have. This is another tool, Magic Eraser. Uh, iPads are great uh, for um, also creating these videos. So, um, Getting the gear, you get what works for you, I would say, like, uh, this is, these are my children trying the first microphone that um, we encountered uh, that was, we thought was a good match. That's a uh, Jetty Blue. Uh, we ended up with a Rode mic. Um, that was, that's the mic that I'm using right now, actually. So you find the gear uh, that best accommodates to your budget and your needs, right? You don't have to be fancy, like, we have to acknowledge that if you have a cell phone, then you have enough to uh, create and upload your own really engaging content. So this is my office studio, still a work in progress. Uh, and you see this, <laughs> that's the behind the scenes. You only have to look good like, uh, I guess from the waist up <laughs> and you could be in your pajamas. Uh, and you, you see this is my green screen. And if you take a look at the lights here, those are not studio lights. Those I bought at Home Depot like for $10, right? So I may have a fancy camera, yes, but some things you can just do very cheaply and that works fine for me. Like uh, it goes well with the editing. Um, and you see, this is the, the product, right? Uh, you saw I was wearing pajamas uh from the waist down and then you see the video and that's the magic right hello everybody i'm marlon valencia and i'm an assistant professor in the department of english well you get the idea right so i mostly use these uh mini uh, lessons for as lesson introductions pretty much to get things going like to get the juices flowing in uh, students minds uh, and uh, they worked quite well and, and uh, students found them engaging uh, this is we video it's one of those apps that you can uh, try for free and then um, the um, license uh, is not so expensive I haven't checked the price recently, but um, I found uh, there's usually uh, educator uh, licenses that are less expensive. And sometimes you can use things for free and you just get maybe a watermark, which is okay. So uh, the development, you generate a lesson plan, you create an outline of your mini lesson and you write a script for your mini lesson. You go over it and adjust things accordingly. So what do I do when I'm recording one of those lessons? Maybe I just do a brief outline, like bullet points, and I stick it to my camera, like right underneath the camera, so that I can look like I'm making eye contact with you. 
and then I have the script there. I don't have a script now, though. <laughs> so because I'm just having a conversation and enjoying my time with you. So uh, that's that's there's a lot of trial and error. You see that here. Uh, I was uh, presenting something at faculty council. You see my principal there uh, from Glendon College. And this is what I was saying, right? And you see how uh, the final product looks uh, when I'm presenting something and I'm just pointing at the green screen and um, then this is what students see. So the implementation is where you deliver your lesson um, and you may choose a combination of both synchronous and asynchronous elements. So what did I use for my classes? This is a class that was 9 to 12 p.m. So I teach at a university, so classes are three hours. So the first hour was asynchronous. I started with a pre-recorded mini lecture, introducing the topic, get, getting students to think about um, ideas or the readings that they did. Then from uh, 10 to 11, we would meet on Zoom. This is very important at least it was for me, because this helps create a sense of community. Like you're there, you're talking to other humans. That was very important for a lot of people, especially when lockdown measures were very strict and people were feeling lonely, right? We are social creatures. We need that contact. And this helps create that online presence that is so important um, to uh, create a, a healthy learning and supporting uh, supportive uh, and collaborative learning community. So um, then 11 to 12 was more asynchronous work uh, and students would maybe engage uh, in an online forum or uh, do some uh, additional work in different formats. Um, and that worked quite well. Uh, and then the evaluation is, it's up to you. Like, how do you evaluate this? So one of the biggest challenges that I think we all faced was that most of our assessment was classroom-based assessment for a bricks and mortar classroom where you could invigilate quite easily. You could just walk around corridors and then uh, see what students were doing right there. Well, boom, that was all gone with uh, remote teaching, right? So what kind of uh, assessment could you use? So we, um, I thought more about using dynamic assessment, which has this uh, feature that uh, you look at the possibilities for the future and see how uh, the, uh, how um, students uh, would perform in the future uh, with the what they've learned in your class and what their future needs might be, right? So um, this was a different type of assessment and I asked them to engage in using the technology that they had at their hand, uh, at their hands uh, so that they could uh, also um, respond to class tasks in that way. So uh, this is a sample evaluation that I want to show you. Uh, so there was a self-reflection that we were doing in, in an ESL class. It's titled English Non-Literary Texts. And um, this is, um, um, I asked uh, students to create a multimodal reflection uh, involving different types of media and submit it uh, on the agreed uh, deadline. So I gave them materials. You also have to be mindful that uh, you have to guide um, students. You provide uh, examples, and then uh, you're mindful that not everybody is at the same level when it comes to um, digital literacies. So I gave them resources on podcasting, uh, photo essays, different kinds of possibilities. And this is a, a multimodal reflection that one of my students, Constance, created that was really cool. Uh, so I want to show you here. This is her assignment. Hi, 
Hi, Mr. Valencia, it's Constance. How are you? Um, I'm just calling you because I would like to know if you could help us to get out of the Glendon campus. We just need you to solve uh, one enigma and then we will be able to end this uh, winter semester. Let us know if you can help us. That would be great. So just click on the pink arrow just under your phone. Let's go. Do you see this is kind of like a trivia game? Oops, I just thought that. Uh, and uh, she photoshopped herself on campus. She's a student who's in France uh, and she couldn't come to Canada and she really wanted to come to Canada. So uh, it's a game. Uh, I have to follow the clues. Uh, let me just show you uh, the end reflection, which she says. Um, it's a really rich assignment. It's it's incredible. Oh, I think, no, not that one. Here. Hi, Elise, how are you? Oh, I'm so happy to have you on FaceTime today. But I think I have to hang up because my teachers need me. Do you mind calling me in a few minutes? Great, see you. Sorry, Elise just called me. Yeah, you know, Elise, my new friend. Oh, yeah, at first I wanted to talk about uh, all the benefits I got. Like I'm able to paraphrase text, I'm able to synthesize an ID, I'm able to understand a graphic. That's the next clue you will have to find. And I'm also able to talk with other people freely. And that's, I think, the most important thing. Like, I've met a new friend. I'm so happy we had this partnership with another class. I've been able to meet a nice girl. So you get an I'm idea so of the I've possibilities met. there. Uh, and um, I haven't checked the chat. Good. OK, so. Um, I was, I'm just mindful of time. Um, you get an idea of what kind of assignments uh, students can create that they're really invested in. Uh, and um, it worked quite well. We created partnerships between um, ESL students and because we have a, a large Francophone population, uh, then um, they were collaborating with each other. Like our... Um, students from uh, the certificate in teaching English were um, learning French and Constance needed to learn um, English, right? So they uh, created these really strong bonds and like we asked them, uh, we paired them first and then we asked them to meet uh, for one hour every week and they became friends and they were just talking like nonstop uh, the whole week and sending each other like packages coming to Canada and going to France and it was great. Uh, okay, good. Thanks for Sebastian. So right now I'm going to jump back to my PowerPoint to get to the second part of the presentation that I promised, uh, just to give you uh, an important um, observation on that so that we don't leave that aside because that's very important. So this is about managing uh, a sustainable and healthy workflow so that we don't have to deal with these issues, right? Uh, you see, uh, teachers are a, a group of professionals that we usually have to justify our own existence and the fact that we, um, we have to make a salary and that it should be a decent one. Uh, and it happens in Canada, it happens in Colombia, uh, where I was born and raised, and it happens in Chile, I know that. But let's make sure it's not as stressful as uh, it could be. One of the problems and uh, one of the things to keep in mind here is that um, there are these uh, pervasive neoliberal uh, narratives that uh, if you work really hard, then you get the good job and you get what you need and what you want. Really? Is it the same for everybody? I don't really know if uh, 
Elon Musk said this, but that is completely irrelevant. The point, and this comes from a, a book that I'm going to recommend you um, check out, is that uh, working um, or maximizing um, work efficiency is not about uh, working more. It's about finding time to be you, right? So um, I know it could be challenging to think about um, all of the learning that we had to do over this year, uh, but here are some takeaways from this book on teacher well-being from Sarah Mercer and uh, Tammy Gregerson. So uh, we must highlight that we're humans, right? So we need uh, physical, mental, um, and um, social well-being and interacting with other humans and with other teachers because that's how we get fresh ideas. So achievement, and listen to this, achievement is due to strategic effort and not, not some innate challenge. So it's not that people are just born with digital literacies. Everybody can learn them. We just have to be very strategic about what we do. So what I often do is I create short-term goals and then long-term goals, right? So my short-term goal for this was um, for this year was creating and uploading engaging mini lessons uh, on YouTube. There were many imperfections, lots of issues, and I'm okay with that. I can live with that. Long-term goal, getting better at it. That may, uh, I'm, I'm going from iMovie to uh, Final Cut which is a much more advanced software. I, I, I'm still not there, but I'm working on it, right? Uh, professional growth should be framed as continual growth. Continual growth. You continue growing. It's not repair. It, there's nothing wrong with you. You have wonderful skills as teachers, right? Uh, there's just more possibilities to learn about um, digital literacies and what we can do online, right? Uh, motivation, there's uh, this um, concept from positive psychology that is called the negativity bias. Humans tend to focus more on the negative side of things. Let's focus on the positives. So agency uh, is important. So keep this in mind. Even if you feel sometimes like you're stuck in a job where maybe administration doesn't help and you don't have the resources that you need and it's frustrating, you make the job. Try to find ways that you can align who you are. That's why I showed you all of those pictures about my pictures and my uh, love for photography and my family. That all has to fit in your teaching self, right? Uh, time management, I uh, already talked about that. Um, find time for yourself. So um, this is what I'm going to suggest uh, that we do in maybe 20 seconds. Think about you. Think about you in five years. So having a vision of the future uh, where you want to be as a teacher is a great way to start planning this. And think about this. It, it applies to digital literacies, but it could apply to anything. So if you close your eyes for just 20 seconds, maybe as I speak, um, and you see yourself five years from now. Think about your career and salary aspirations. Yes, salary. And I mean it because you work really hard. You deserve to make decent money to get compensated for all the hours that you put into your teaching. Think about your professional development. Maybe you're doing a master's. Maybe you've done it. Maybe you're moving into a PhD. Maybe you're doing something else on the side. Think about your family, all of those things. So what do you expect to have accomplished in five years? And then when you open your eyes, you jot down three ideas. Something you can do today, something that you can do this month, and something that you can do this year to get closer to that ideal self. So with this, I am closing. Um, here, um, this is a view of uh, that aligns with Bonnie Norton's idea of identity. Identity is how a person understands his or her relationship to the world, 
how that relationship is structured across time and space and how the person understands possibilities for the future. So in other words, identity is who I was because that brought me where I am today. Identity is who I am today and identity is who I want to be in the future, right? Because I make decisions today based on that envisioned future. So think about what you want to do to improve your remote teaching uh, because the remote teaching and online teaching is here to stay. I definitely think so. Uh, you can always uh, reach me and we I will be more than happy to continue this conversation uh, with you and um, I'm delighted to, um, to hear uh, your thoughts and experiences. Thank you very much, Dr. Valencia. And now we have 10 minutes for questions. So I will be monitoring the chat. We haven't received any questions yet. We have lots of comments. Uh, we have a comment from Nancy that says, I loved your funny and creative videos, but I am thinking on how shy I am in front of the camera or even my students. Uh, could be also shy to act or have that kind of presentation. Let's see, we have some thank yous here. Uh, we have a comment from Magdalena Alvarez. It's important that our, that our students can get to know us not only as teachers, but also as human beings. And we have a question from Thomas Keller. Have you tried OBS Studio for teaching? Wonderful, well, thank you very much. Uh, so I will begin by answering um, uh, Thomas's question. Uh, no, I haven't tried it. And that's why we need to have these conversations. Maybe you get some uh, new idea or, um, on, a, on software or a different use for it uh, from me. And then I learned something new from you. I, I haven't tried it. So I've been stuck with Mac for a while. Uh, and I think, and going back to what I just said, we are social creatures and uh, we thrive on uh, exchanging ideas together. So uh, going back to uh, Nancy's um, comment, I think that this camera right here in front of us, or yeah, all of us, is a great opportunity for us to try and um, do things a little differently. Um, like sometimes, like for me, um, it's been really challenging sometimes to talk to a bunch of names on a screen, but maybe, uh, and because you could be doing pre-recorded lessons, uh, it's a lot of trial and error. So you try and record your, fir your first lesson, keeping in mind that it doesn't have to be perfect. So embrace imperfection, like I just said, uh, and um, then uh, see how things go. Maybe you feel more comfortable uh, knowing that uh, you're just doing this for the camera and not uh, directly. Oh, like uh, synchronously uh, in front of students. So try the possibilities. Uh, so the comment uh, from uh, Macarena, yes, I absolutely agree. We are human beings, we have feelings. And oh God, it's been a really challenging year for me. Like uh, just uh, before this presentation, like I was trying to figure out my way on uh, Zoom with Sebastian who helped me a lot. Uh, because I, I got rusty. I haven't taught online since uh, April. So uh, yeah, I agree. Um, we have strengths. D let's not forget that. Um, that's very important. Um, and yes, I, I like the, the uh, citation about the ideal future self from uh, uh, Dornay. And uh, let me see. And here we have a question by Claudia Parra. She asks, uh, how, oh, just a second. She asks, how do you think students' learning outcomes are affected by remote learning? Oh, it's, a, it's a, a very important question. I can tell you about my students. So I have um, students uh, here 
in Toronto who are Francophone. And uh, we have a, a large Francophone population and that's who we mainly serve at Glendon. And some of those students were in the uh, African uh, Francophonie. So uh, Senegal uh, and other Francophone countries. And those students in Toronto lost the chance to go out on the streets of Toronto and use their English. And sometimes uh, some of them were working like, for example, I had a, um, a lady in one of my classes who was working for one of the French school boards. So she spoke French at work, French at home, and her only chance to um, use English was pretty much my class. And when I put them into breakout rooms, they were speaking French. So uh, it affects uh, students' lives in many ways. Sometimes it's a bit of a challenge also to, um, to do group work uh, because they feel like, I don't know these people. And uh, sometimes we had students that were uh, in a very challenging time zone for uh, being on, uh, on time for class, right? Because it, our uh, 6 p.m. was their midnight or their 1 a.m. And uh, so it changed uh, everybody's lives in, in many ways. And sometimes it was also motivation. They just didn't feel like turning on their cameras or like everything was the same. So that's why I invested myself as much as I could to make things a little different, acknowledging that there's so much uh, content on YouTube posted by YouTubers that might not be great, but is well produced and engaging, right? It's a challenge. Uh, we also have a question by uh, Eliana Vidal. She's asking, what teaching strategies would you recommend for mass online classes like with large groups of students? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat it? I was just reading another comment and <laughs> got, it, got the mix. <laughs> Sure, yes. So Eliana asks, uh, what teaching strategies would you recommend for large cl online classes? Um, I really liked the uh, uh, asynchronous and synchronous uh, content combination because it allowed uh, students to work at their own pace. Um, time should always be negotiable. What I said always was that I was proposing that one hour, one hour, and one hour uh, blocks of a combined synchronous and asynchronous, but that uh, we could change things as needed. So sometimes our class meetings uh, were two hours instead of just one hour, um, because maybe we needed more time to do those discussions. So asynchronous content works quite well because students can do work on, at their own pace and independently. And then if it's a large class, then there's other things that you can use, uh, like uh, for example, Google Jamboard works well to like post uh, sticky notes and uh, share ideas and, and do group work there for large classes. Um, and there, there are other possibilities uh, as well. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Carolina Castro. Oh, it's actually a comment uh, about deals with uh, software that go to uh, where you can also buy software that goes to charity. And we have a question by Mary Hopkins. She asks, how do you involve students who are more introverted in an interactive session, especially when they are extra inhibited by speaking a foreign language? Um, well, that's the thing, right? Uh, what I found myself uh, thinking a lot about was that like presentations, we kept telling students so much not to read from a script. And there we were facing that uh, precise uh, thing, right? Like uh, many students were just reading from a script because they could just do it we like, they could be doing what I recommended <laughs> to do for a pre-recorded lesson. They just put the paper there and read from it. Um, so you have to think about ways in which you can change that. 
So one thing that you can do is you can start by acknowledging that having that script could also be a good learning opportunity, like preparing the script. Maybe you can ask them to create the script for a, a video lesson and then, uh, or a, a video presentation. And then you can um, have them uh, send that script to you so you can go over it uh, and give them feedback. And then maybe you can even have them write up behind the scenes reflection, which is really good for us as evaluators to know what's going on because you see one thing, but you don't know what the person had planned. You, you don't know if the plans uh, worked out or not. And then you don't know how they felt about it because maybe you thought that uh, they did very well and they, maybe they think that they did very poorly. So this creates important um, communicative opportunities to use the language uh, for us to connect more as human beings, I think. We also have a question from Natalia Rojas. She asks, how do you think we can build up a better sense of responsibility in our students as remote learning requires a lot of autonomy? That's a very good point and engagement is key. So um, I got very positive feedback on the uh, combined uh, synchronous and asynchronous um, format of the class. I think that uh, I even got in the final evaluations that some students still remember the Halloween uh, mini lesson uh, or introductory video. So uh, trying to have fun, uh, just as you did in the classroom, uh, like finding creative ways of uh, connecting, of reaching out to them, being uh, goofy and, uh, and being that, being you, right? Uh, whatever um, strengths you have, like try to highlight them and uh, try to find ways in which homework doesn't feel like homework. Like one of the things that I've done before is uh, many of my students uh, complained about how boring it was to write essays, right? And I agree, it's a very uh, like, like very structured um, genre that uh, doesn't give a lot of possibilities. Uh, it's, it's what it is, right? So what did I do? because I was teaching at an institution in which many people were uh, very interested or invested in um, all of the graphic arts. Uh, I had many photographers and uh, future graphic designers, all that. So I said, okay, let's do a photo essay. So where do I start? I said, well, I love photography. I don't have any formal training in photography, but I'm gonna teach a class introductory class to photography and you are photographers you can jump in and you can contradict me and you can say like that's not the way it is and that's fine and then we went on a photo walk and you should see what they created uh, their essays were really amazing nobody complained about having a writer's blog I had a student who wrote an essay that was a love story between a can of coke and a coffee cup so uh, find ways in which students can bring in their own identities, who they are, and their uses of literacy. Because if we just keep teaching with the um, textbook about that um, compare and contrast essay, and we don't find ways in which they can also show what they know and um, shine, then it's a challenge. Thank you. We're almost out of time, but I think we can squeeze in just one more question. Uh, so we have uh, we have someone who was asking uh, here, what was the app or software that your student used in the in her presentation? She photoshopped herself at university, but the whole presentation was great. Yes. So let me see. It was called. Uh... Genially, let me just see if I can paste the 
URL here. So that's, I know that's incomplete. I just don't want to give you her assignment, <laughs> but you, you may be able to find it from there, okay? Great. So once again, we thank everyone for their participation. And of course, we thank our speaker, Dr. Marlon Valencia. Dr. Marlon, do you have any final words that you would like to address to the audience? Well, I am very happy to be here. Uh, I had a lot to share uh, and I did my best to make it as coherent as possible. So uh, my apologies for uh, anything that may not have been so clear. Uh, and I know uh, this was a, a session for uh, exchanging ideas and for thinking about the strengths that we have as teachers. And I am very happy that you're taking the time to put up with me for more than 30 minutes uh, and uh, that shows that you really care about what you do. So you're the kind, uh, the kind of teachers that I want uh, to teach my children. Thank you very much. You have my email there and uh, we can certainly keep in touch. Thank you. And now before we leave the session, just a reminder. Uh, we remind you that at the end of the two days of presentations, you will be able to download the certificate of participation. We also invite you now to join our next speaker, Dr. Gabriel Diaz Maglioli, talking about survival strategies for emergency remote teachers, planning, teaching, and assessing at 12 o'clock, following the link on our website. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks.